We're sitting here in Austin, South by Southwest, the final day, and I have Vampire Weekend, one half of the band, Ezra and Rostam, sitting here with me to talk about this brand new record, Modern Vampires of the City. After this first record came out, your first record came out all these years ago, you guys got very busy, um, then you made Contra and to it again. What kind of environment was this record made in? Were you on the road? Were you at home in New York? Where were you when you were writing Modern Vampires of the City? Well... It's it's always a little funny to talk about writing because generally by the time we, we officially start working on the album we've already amassed a lot of little ideas. So arguably some of the writing happens on the road or in, in all sorts of different situations. The first session actually was Ross and I just getting together casually in LA. We both happened to be there. But then the bulk of it was working in New York. Usually we don't actually record on the road even though maybe we're, we're thinking about the next album. So you know we toured behind Contra, then we took a break. And that was kind of like the first proper break we'd taken in years, uh, you know, with all the records. And um, then we started working on it in New York. We ended up finishing in L.A., but it was primarily worked on in New York. Do you think that it was a very different way of recording than, than Contra, than the last experience, Rustin? In some ways it was different. In other ways it was similar. Um, one of the ways that it was really different was that we wrote a lot of songs and, and we didn't keep them. There were a lot of songs. Every time we sort of get these batches of songs every few weeks or few months and um, we weren't precious with them. If, if a song wasn't good enough, we just, we let it die, which was hard to do and it was a unique experience because in the past there was only one or two, you know, for each album there was only one or two that that sort of, sort of was the case. But with this album there was so many songs that by the time, you know, we'd sp spent about a year just kind of focused on songwriting, by the time we got to the point where we had, you know, 12 that we felt really good about. It had been quite a process already. What is it about this time in your life that you feel that you were able to not only write so many songs but be able to, to let some go? Did you have a vision about the kind of record you wanted this one to, to be? Absolutely, and we always have a vision, but um, on this record, we just felt like we had to keep going, like we didn't want to settle, and uh, we wanted this record to be really special, so we just kept, we just kept at it, sort of. There was a bit of vocal manipulation that was explored on Contra. This record has got a whole lot more uh, things going on in terms of experimental stuff, which um, when I first heard it, I was like, whoa, <laughs> there's, there's some cool things happening on this. Can you tell us a little bit about going down that route and, and having the confidence to kind of weird out on, on a few of these songs? Sure. I mean, we, we tend not to think of things too much in terms of experimental versus non-experimental. We generally try just to do stuff that we think sounds fresh and, you know, sometimes on this album some things we got most excited about were very simple things. You might might even call them traditional, that might be a stretch, but you know, just some, you know, there, there are certain songs on this record where, you know, we use just very simple things like piano or organ, things we hadn't used before. And then the stuff that maybe seems crazy, it, you know, it, it, it all gets so funny now. It's like you throw on the radio, Arguably, everything sounds crazy, you know? If you somebody who hadn't heard music for 20 years just started listening to, like, pop music right now, everything would sound like the, the weirdest, most experimental thing ever. The synth sounds and the, you know, the way the vocals sound. It would all sound insane. So really, we've always kind of been more interested in just combining things. So I think some of the coolest moments on the record are where something that sounds traditional and maybe something that seems very modern come together and it feels natural more than anything. Okay, maybe sometimes you hear something for the first time and it's like very shocking, but eventually I think it all kind of makes perfect sense. We kind of just let our taste guide us. Yeah, the record definitely is a grower. I know that's a horribly obvious <laughs> term, but when I listened to it the first time, I was like, whoa, and then the more and more I listened to it, I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is going to be a, a loved record. It begins... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing with the vocal manipulation. Some, some, in some cases, things just sort of happen by accident. And it was like a happy accident that we liked, like the song Yahe, those pitch shifted Yahe's were initially just a product of trying to find the best key for the song and shifting it around and, and sort of testing what was the best key to sing the song in. And that just happened to be the cause of those crazy alien sounding Yahe's. But then we realized that we really liked them, that they had this quality that we wanted to preserve. And then in other cases, like in Diane Young, the vocal manipulation was us sort of sitting and saying, this part of the song just it feels like it needs one more element to, to make it just a little bit more interesting to listen to. Have you thought about how you're going to recreate that live? Have you recreated it live yet? 
come to we, Yeah, we just figured it out. Tonight, <laughs> tonight we're going to give it a try. Yeah, it's actually not that hard. I mean, you know, basically it's the, it's the same idea. Everybody's actually singing, but then we're running it through things so that we can, you know, more or less approximate the effects. And that's kind of even more fun that, you know, we're, we're actually doing it live. It's all happening live. And for all the people who haven't heard the record, which is pretty much everyone, you're going to be able to see all their faces in stubs going, what? what? <laughs> yes, we're very excited about that. The record begins in a fairly minimal way with Obvious Bicycle. Uh, what's that pumping sound that is the drum sound? That is a crazy sound. What is that? I think Steve Lamack said that that sounded like a stapler <laughs> or a staple gun. The story behind that song is that it started with this piano and these very, very complicated drums that I recorded and I sent to Ezra and, and he started writing on top of it. And then once we sort of written the song, we realized that we didn't need those complicated drums anymore. So it was Ezra's idea to try incorporating some Nyabingi drums, which are a traditional Jamaican drumming practice. And uh, we just kind of realized that those really hysterical drums, they were necessary to write the song, but we didn't need them in the final recording. We could have really sparse drums that could let everything breathe and let, let you hear us playing and singing. Yeah, you can hear you can hear the space that you're recording in. It's also a super stripped back way to begin a Vampire Weekend record. Did you choose that song to start the record for a reason? Well, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, but the truth is Rossum sent me the the original like music for that song and over a pretty long time I'd listen to it and like slowly start to write some lyrics and stuff. And even then when I was first kind of just like messing around with it, uh, I always just had a feeling it would be the track one on the next album something about it just seemed like track one you know when you have an idea like that you, you don't know if it's actually going to make it to the finished product because how can it be track one if you don't know what the rest of the tracks are but by the end it, it it only made more sense yeah it's a great entry into the record and gives nothing away about what i'm about to hear as well <laughs> which well, is nice i think that's something I've, that i've seen interviews with radiohead where they've talked about how they like for the first song to almost have nothing to do with the rest of the album just as a way of mm tripping people up a little bit so well the other thing i find a lot of bands do is releasing the first single that sounds completely different to the record your record is incredibly varied i don't know whether that's going to be the case but diane young is that the first single from this new album yes and we're releasing it on monday i think the triple j is going to premiere it tuesday which is monday american time oh, okay. can you tell us a little bit about diane young and why you chose this as the first single a bit about the making of, of that song well that song started with this idea for like a punk song with saxophone and I felt like possessed that I wanted to record that. So I called up my friend who played sax and he came to my apartment and I I'd sort of mocked up some punk drums and a chord progression and I had him come and record the sax parts. And then it was just something that I had and I just didn't know what to do with it. So I sent it to Ezra. I was like, you, you want to try writing something on top of this? So that's how this sort of, that's how it began. And um, the Diane Young part was was came pretty quickly, and that sort of inspired Ezra to write the second part of the song, the baby, baby, baby part. And then we sort of put them together. And, and then we had sort of a version of the song. We took it to L.A. We were all sitting together, um, me, Ezra, and Ariel Rekshide, who produced the album with me. He was in front of the computer, and we were trying to figure out how to make that baby, baby, baby part more exciting. And at first we tried pitch shifting the whole thing down, and it kind of sounded like a demon had possessed Ezra. <laughs> but we found a sort of a middle ground between making it vocally really interesting and fresh and also not making it, you know, completely... Uh... Evil? <laughs> yes. Who is Diane Young? Or is it Dying Young? Well, it could have been either, so it was right on the fence. <laughs> Diane Young just sounded so much more pleasant, <laughs> so... And I'm really glad we didn't call the song Dying Young. Uh, and this is before Kesha's song, too, so even more reason. Why not have a nice, a nice woman's name yeah. as the title? But then in some ways, once you make that decision and you finish writing the lyrics, it does start to seem like some type of person, perhaps a symbolic person. In this case, you know, we have songs that are named after people that we know. We have actually quite a few, but Dying Young is not one of them. Although now that we start doing press, people are saying, like, oh, is they that Diane Young is some sort of like dermatologist in New York who specializes in like skin rejuvenation, which is Where pretty... Where did I get that from? I guess she's like the first Diane Young that comes up on Google. <laughs> That's pretty funny though to be a dermatologist who specializes in making people look younger and be named Diane Young. <laughs> so I guess there are a lot of Diane Youngs in the world, but <laughs> the, the one in the song is our own creation. I'm just wondering if people now suddenly think that you guys have been like trying to go for the uh, fountain of youth and seeing this Diane Young and this is your tribute. Since your debut record came out in 2008, in the years that have followed, so many bands have tried to emulate 
The Sound of Vampire Weekend. Is this album a shift away from your signature sound to try and get away from that, get away from that pack of people nipping at your heels? Well, people say that. We've, we've rarely heard a band and thought they actually sounded like us. And I'm not trying to be modest because realistically I think we're a hard band to copy. I just think like the, the certain things that people associate with Vampire Weekend are not necessarily actually the essence of the band. I think this album contains the essence of Vampire Weekend as much as the first two. Who knows, maybe even more. So we're definitely not trying to avoid things out of like fear or because we think anything else is happening. We're just trying to go towards the things that we really think sound great. And repeating ourselves is not really an option. It is just kind of impossible to do. But I think I think like people who really understand our band will hear this record and they'll despite the fact that it's different, they'll immediately kind of see how it, it's us and see the connections. And I think that's the best type of album you can possibly make, one that's very different but still feels just as much part of your identity as, as the previous ones. What do you think it is that makes Vampire Weekend Vampire Weekend? What is your essential essence? Can you put your finger on it? If we could bottle it, we would sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think over the course of doing a bunch of press, two things that struck me that were really important to us making the record, maybe not super consciously, but I think if you like Vampire Weekend, it's important to you to have good songwriting. And so that's one thing that we were obsessed by for this record. We wanted the songs just to be amazing. On one level of songwriting, and then on another level, we want to make records that don't sound like other people's records or sound like everything else that you you might be hearing mm. and so that governs a lot of our decision making we want to we want unique sounding records so those are the two things that i think are the essence of what we're after worship you is a very hectic song on the record <laughs> um what can you tell me about the making of that one um well that was actually one of the first ones that we worked on that came out of a, th that session when Russ and I just happened to be in LA and we got together, we worked on Obvious Bicycle and that one, like we said before, had been marinating for a while so that was obvious but then Worship You, I'd had this idea for a song for a while so I just played it to Russ on the piano, he immediately got these arrangement ideas, started banging on the drums and getting that <laughs> groove cooking and like playing an, uh, an electric guitar that wasn't plugged in and it immediately had this very distinct flavor that kind of had this like Celtic energy, which we love. I mean, we've always loved Irish music, and that song, just like the second you hear it, has this like very Irish sound. But then there's already in the, that first demo something very modern about it. And then, you know, like Ross and playing this uh, synth solo that he put in there, it immediately felt like this interesting combination. So that happens with a lot of our songs. We come up with a demo quickly, and we're really psyched on it. And then to actually finish it is a very long process. That one went through a few different iterations, but, you know, in the end it become, you know, one of the more epic songs we've ever made, one of, like, the biggest, and we started a little bit trying to play it live, and it's been pretty fun so far. Well, you're singing very fast. Can you actually do it? That's, that's going to be tough. I think I can do it, but <laughs> to actually be able to do it night after night is going to be difficult, but that's the same way I felt about California English on the last album. You know, like, you do something in the studio, and you break it into parts, and you're like, okay. Then you actually try to do it, like, you know, and you start to realize, wow, this is really difficult to do. But then, that's why you got to practice. <laughs> It'll yeah. happen. There's a tip for bands. Just practice, everything will be fine. Yeah. Um, there's a few samples on this record, too. Are they found sounds, or are they you guys messing around with, I guess, fake samples, uh, constructed samples? Where are they from? Do you mean the, the sounds of the, of the crowds? I mean people doing spoken word. Is that... Oh, you, Ezra? That's, that's funny. A lot of people keep saying the spoken word parts are samples. Well, it sounds like something ye olde. The accent's pretty cool, but is that just you? <laughs> I don't know what people are saying <laughs> no about accent. the. I don't know what people are saying about the accents, but my whole life I've been getting. I've been accused of having um, some kind of weird accent, <laughs> and maybe my accents changed over the years. I don't know, but the. Well, I mean, of course, we put a lot of thought into the way the vocals sound. So there might be different parts of a song where the vocal sound changes, you know, that that's like a big part of the production in, in the band. So that might be part of why those parts sound a little bit sampled. But uh, yeah, the, the two spoken word parts on the record are just me talking. They're just like part of the song. But um, it's very interesting to me that people think it's a sample. I don't know why. Somebody said I was talking with a British accent, and I, that is something that I'm self-conscious about, because it's very easy as an American to want to sing with a British accent. Because really? there's, there's just something so, like, well, you grow up listening to so much music sung by British people. There's something like, that's very tempting about certain, like, vowel sounds and that, you know, the British accent kind of seems like a good way to sing. So I've had to be careful to avoid it, so maybe not well enough. <laughs> we'll let the, everybody else be the judge. There's a lot of vignettes on this record as well, lovely little stories. Are they stories that are close to home? 
Yeah, a lot of them. I mean, we like the idea that each album is kind of its own world, its own universe, and that the music and the lyrics and the vocals, it all kind of comes together. And I think to get that feeling of it being a world, you do have to have these little stories that kind of give somebody like the lay of the land, a sense of what's going on. And I think that's, you know, and that doesn't mean that it's a rock opera and that you're like following a specific character as they, you know, like meet a wizard or something, but that you get these little <laughs> tastes of the time and the place and the the world in which it was made. So definitely there's uh, stories that are straight up stories that a, f a friend told or something having to do with somebody that you know, something that happened to you, you know, that happens. But yeah, we like to kind of just mix it all up. Do you think with age you're more confident in wearing your heart on your sleeve a lot more and opening up a little bit more on your records? I think so. I think in some ways this album, there's certain moments in this album that I think are kind of like the most straightforwardly emotional or romantic. and. I think all of our albums, you know, we, we like emotional music. I, th I think that's a good way to know when you're on the right track with a song. Do you, like, feel something? So that's always been the case with all the records, but even the songs that maybe had to do with relationships or emotions, maybe on, like, the first album, there might be a little more of a, might be a little more sarcasm at times or, you know, kind of, like, youthful humor. Whereas I think, yeah, as we get older, maybe in some ways it's easier to kind of, like, zero in on expressing a direct emotion without feeling too corny. Like when you're young, a lot of times you're very scared about being corny. And, and sometimes you, it takes a while to figure out, oh, you can actually like talk about real emotions like love and fear and, you know, the things that everybody experiences without like emotionally selling out, you know? <laughs> Do you feel like you're becoming more or less cynical as you get older? Well, it depends about what. I think as you get older, I'd like to think less in some ways. I think as you get older you start to realize you can have like appreciation for the simpler things in life um, and you start to you know to, to think more just about like love and happiness and you know what makes a good life and in that sense I think I, I'd hope that I'm getting less cynical I mean but then there's like all sorts of crazy stuff always happening in the world that makes you more cynical so it's always like kind of a fight between like the personal and the outside world. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the space that you recorded in because I heard that you were in an old Hollywood studio for, for some of this. Can you tell me about that, Rustam? Yeah. For the first time in our band's history, we recorded all of the drums and, or a lot of the drums and a lot of the bass to analog tape. And we did it in this old studio that was built in the 30s, which is now called Vox. And the studio has linoleum floors and it just has this quality that when you capture sound inside of it, you're also capturing the sound of that old room. It's not a huge room, but it, it's big enough that you feel the size of it in the recording. So that, that became a big part of the sound of the record, and it was something that we chose to really accentuate at times, too. And some of the drums on the record are really squashed, and you can really feel the room pumping with, with the drumming. It seems a lot of bands are recording just drums to tape these days. I've been speaking to so many bands who are doing that. Everything else might be recorded digitally, but the drums are going analogue. Well, I could give you a very technical <laughs> answer to that question involving transients. <laughs> um, basically, when you're hitting something, it's making a spike in the sound wave. So the, the tape is nice because it takes those spikes and it blurs them a little bit. It softens the spikes. And then what that lets you do is really crush them later on and they never get harsh or painful to listen to, just pleasant. That was a good layman's explanation <laughs> of why you do that. Good descriptive terms. How would you describe this record for all the people who haven't heard it? Is there a way that you can sum up Modern Vampires of the City? Mm. It's always difficult to sum up our albums, even now that we've been a band for six years. If I meet some random person at the airport who's making small talk and that's what I do, and I tell them I'm in a band, and they're like, oh, what type of band? I still barely know what to say. I think the songs in this album, there's a lot of diversity, but they all kind of go together. I think it's like kind of a, a grand, romantic New York Vampire Weekend record. That's maybe the best way I could describe it. Are you going to bring the record to Australia? Are there plans to do it? There are plans to do it, either later this year or next year. We haven't figured that out yet, but there are plans. Well, you were only here like about five minutes ago for Big Day right. Out. That was a lot of fun. We were, it was very nice that we got to be in Sydney for the hottest day of all time. Yeah, God, that, that's right. We got to be a little part of Australia history. Yeah, that was a truly awful day, and I felt for every single human out at the Big Day Out. Did you guys wear black jeans on stage? I was looking at bands thinking, what are you doing? Give up the look, just wear underwear. I was I was so scared about like passing out and also that we we hadn't we hadn't played shows that many shows recently so you know it really had to like pace ourselves so 
tried to dress as lightly as possible. But I mean, even for us, we only need to be on stage for an hour. It's the kids and the audience are the real troopers. Yeah, I felt for them. You guys are so good. Thank you so much.